Welcome back to another video. Today, I am going to be sharing with you a breakdown of my top stocks for 2021, but really, they're for the medium to long term, not just for 2021. And this is based off the potential they've shown, as there is such a wide spectrum of stocks to follow. And as you know, I like to go more in depth on a stock rather than just tell you to buy because someone tweeted it had 10x potential. Therefore, I'll be focusing on the stocks that I've covered already on this channel. And if you want to dive deeper, then you can watch the analysis and valuation I have done on that company. Now, these picks aren't necessarily in order at all. They are definitely not in order of the biggest gap from fair value to current market price. So it's also factoring in the potential for growth beyond what I could probably put into a realistic or conservative, I like to do, valuation model. For example, Intel would probably be the second on the list of pure value versus current price and lemonade would be one of the worst however i'm still very bullish on lemonade because of the potential it has to far exceed my original expectations and what i was comfortable putting into a valuation model and although i do feel intel is undervalued i'm still skeptical about making it a big position because of the various business and operational factors there's also the point that they're probably the company that's to be disrupted, if anything, unless they can change something around within the company quite rapidly. You will also notice that all of these are disruptors in the industry that they serve, whether that be finance, real estate, or retail, they are all doing things separate to the status quo. And the reason why it's so hard to value these disruptors is that they have you know, significant added value to their business every single quarter. So they change rapidly, and that's why... You know, my valuations from, say, November and December will likely need to be adjusted in some way. And the reason why I'm so focused on disruptors is in 10 to 20 years, I feel humans will be doing the same things we are doing now. However, we will be doing them very differently in innovative, more efficient and sustainable ways, whether that be in terms of energy consumption, commerce, banking, communications, travel. I feel that the best play is to be in the innovation but not on the cutting edge, if that makes sense. So I wouldn't like to pick the winners of an entirely new or quite unknown field, such as, say, robotics or genomics, for example, as we don't know too much about the markets themselves and the waves of change that can hit you. So I feel picking the potential winners of innovating existing markets will be easier, less risky, and just as rewarding, if not more. So with that introduction, let's start with number five, which is Palantir. And the reason why I like Palantir is it's a data analytics and software as a service company that has the aim of being the most important software company in the world. Also, its customers are big ticket commercial and state organizations that have very deep pockets and rapidly increasing demand. So this suggests that their total addressable market can be expanding at a rapid pace as well, instead of just staying still and then capturing more and more of it. Talking of their total addressable market, they have a very small capture of their 120 billion total addressable market. And it also has two major qualities that I look for in a long-term compounder, and that is recurring revenue streams. And they have this through annual contract payments for software and data services. They also have very high gross margins and a low cost of revenue, meaning once the company matures and transitions out of the growth stage, it will have lots of room for a healthy profit margin and cash flows. Now, my thoughts on Palantir's valuation. In my valuation, I valued Palantir at around $22 to $32 per share. And again, all of these fair values are going to be based off a 15% discount rate. So just keep that in mind. And the spread of that 32 to 22 is because of the two different growth assumptions that I had. The first being a 30% growth rate and the second being a bull case, which was a 35% growth rate. And these are for the decade. So it's a long-term growth rate. It's currently selling at $34 per share, meaning you would need to be pretty bullish on its story and growth for the next five to 10 years to see it as great value today. Luckily, a lot of people are. And, uh, you know, I could see it being a stock that always sells at a premium. So whether you will actually get that drop below 30 again, you know, will be unknown. But it's something that I already own and I will be keeping an eye on to see if it drops again. I think it's a very good company with a very good future. Number four is Lemonade Insurance. And the reason why I like Lemonade is Lemonade is a real disruptor in the insurance industry, which is so ripe for disruption I can't even put it into words. It really is an industry of dinosaurs. 
Lemonade has the potential to grow much larger than its current capitalization, even though it has doubled in size since I last valued the stock. As Lemonade you know, plans to be a global insurer, their total addressable market is $6 trillion, a huge number that means even a 0.5% market share would take them to be a $30 billion company. And that's also not adjusted for expected inflation. Their trifecta of disruption is leading to very fast growth and high customer retention. They've got a customer-centric business model, which is rare to come by in insurance, AI and machine learning underwriting and claims process, which makes the process quicker and the decision-making a lot more accurate. Positive culture and brand image, which again is something that's hard to come by in insurance. They also benefit, like Palantir, from recurring revenues with insurance contracts renewing annually and their retention rates being one of the highest in the industry. One thing I also like is they are backed by some of the biggest and most successful insurers in the world, including Allianz and AXA XL. Thoughts on their valuation now. Lemonade have been on a very fast run-up since we last spoke about it. It's now selling at $140 per share, which is steep, uh, probably past my buy price for now, considering I already own a fair chunk of it. It's a company that's growing at 100% annually and continues to eat into the huge market that it serves. One thing that also makes it seem more overvalued than it actually is, is that they have to report their revenues operating revenue, which is actually only 45% of their gross earned premiums, which in any normal insurance business would be classed as your top line revenue. And this is because of their reinsurance program that passes off a large percentage of Lemonade's premium in exchange for the reinsurers covering their claims. I did an in-depth explanation of how reinsurance works and how their program is layered and how it affects Lemonade in my Lemonade video. So you can check that out if you are still unsure. Now, I believe Lemonade can reach over 30 billion in gross earned premium over the next 10 years or longer, given it can sustain its viable competitive advantages and expand globally. And at 1.5 times gross earned premium, they could potentially have a market cap of 45 billion in the next decade, which is a 4 or 5x from here. Number three is Alibaba. And the reason why I like Alibaba, I have covered it quite a bit on this channel, so you probably will know, but Alibaba is a highly diversified business with a presence in some of the fastest growing industries in the world. E-commerce, fintech, and cloud services, just to name a few. They are also in one of the fastest growing economies in the world, which is soon to be the largest economy in the world. They are a large company already, and it's unlikely we will see something like a 5 to 6x in the next five years. But I'm confident in its future successes and believe its huge growth and fantastic fundamentals will shine through eventually. Even with a bearish view on the China situation and regulation issues, the consistent achievement of 20 to 30% growth is lifting the floor on the stock, which I believe is already at its floor. China's newest anti-monopoly rules look to have fairly limited impact for now. At a forward PE of near 22 times, I think this is one of the most undervalued big tech names available in the market right now. My most recent valuation gave me a fair value of $310 per share for Alibaba based on 25% growth for the next five years, which looks likely given the string of tailwinds they have behind them and their obvious competitive advantages. Because of their huge total addressable market and they possess the largest e-commerce GMV and customer base in the world, I honestly believe Alibaba has all the characteristics to be as big, if not bigger, than Amazon, who are currently over $300 billion in revenue, given that there is no restriction on their size and growth from the Chinese government's regulations, which I think, again, is unlikely. This is without mentioning the fact that they're a lot more profitable than Amazon and have more of a capital-like business model. Again, I've covered all my thoughts on Alibaba and the uh, government issues previous to this video, so feel free to check them out if you want more information. Now, number two is Opendoor, and Opendoor is a very disruptive company in the real estate market that allows people to buy and sell their homes or properties with ease. They adopt data science and machine learning to their business, which allows them to make quick cash offers that are unlikely to lose their money on the resale. Benefits of using Opendoor are that they are much more simple, you have higher certainty and clarity around costs. 
you also have a much faster closing process. They have a customer centric business model, which is not common in the real estate market. But as I mentioned in my open door video, I believe will be critical to being a winner in the real estate market going forward. Their total addressable market sits around 1.3 to 1.6 trillion, meaning they only need a tiny capture of the market to be a success from here. The real estate market is also very early in its adoption of digital innovation, meaning open door have a head start. Their compound annual growth rate, excluding this year's COVID blip, was 149% over five years, which is huge growth. My thoughts on their valuation, similar with all of these disruptor or high growth stocks, open door trades at a big premium, if we're being honest. They also have very low gross margins, which was a worry for me at the start. But after looking into it a little bit more, it seems they have fairly straightforward plans to increase those gross margins by scaling up the fee slightly and introducing some more valuable ancillary coverages, meaning that I'm a bit more confident in my valuation model that estimated a 6% EBITDA margin. Now, 6% margin isn't great at all, I will mention that, but based off that EBITDA projection of 6% and their $50 billion revenue estimate that they set themselves and we ran with uh, for the next 10 years, you could potentially see close to a 6x over the next decade, which is a very good return. My fair value was around $30 to $37 dollars per share, depending on how quickly they can become profitable. Um, with that current price being $26 per share, it seems like there is still some very good upside. My fair value was around $30 to $37 per share. And the reason for the spread there is that it depends on how quickly they can become profitable. Uh, the current price is currently $26 per share. And that means that there's still some good upside in my opinion. Now, number one is SoFi. Firstly, I just need to say that this is all based on the assumption that the merger actually goes through with no changes or issues. So we should really refer to it as IPOE or SoFi. But if I'm being honest, one of the big attractions to SoFi for me is the fact that it's in an industry which is personal fintech that I just want to be exposed to in my portfolio. Unfortunately, some of the other companies that I do really like as businesses like Square are just too richly valued for me to put a significant investment into. And that's just my opinion, obviously. But I will talk about SoFi's valuation in a moment. But I like SoFi because it offers a suite of products that, in my opinion, look very attractive to consumers. They beat banks in all areas, in my opinion, of being low to no fees. They have attractive lending rates when compared to banks. And they do it all on one mobile app that is quicker and slicker than the competition. It's also operating in another industry that is just ripe for disruption. Banking, similar to insurance or real estate, is, is full of dinosaurs that lack customer-centric business models and have very low levels of digital innovation. And at least on the front end of the business, that is, they also have a clear pathway to high profitability and generally have characteristics of a high margin and high efficiency business model, which is actually uncommon when measured against some of the other disruptors on this list and also its peers. So apart from probably Palantir and Alibaba on this list, they also have a software segment of the business that provides technology and payments infrastructure to the majority of fintech startups currently. And Robin Hood being a notable customer of theirs, which is quite interesting to consider. And my thoughts on their valuation is the valuation gets slightly complicated due to the IPOE stock representing around 9% of the merged company. Uh, but I've done a video explaining all of this. If you are still unsure, all we have to do is basically reverse engineer that percentage to get a merged company value. And based off of SoFi and Chamath's own projections, plus some added projections of my own, I get a fair value for IPO e stock of $33 per share or a 6x return over a 10-year period when compared to its peers in the industry and adjusted for earnings growth. That seems very cheap. Fintech companies do always trade at a premium because they have such large total addressable markets and it's growing at a double digit rate annually. So they're always going to trade at a premium in my opinion. Someone did make a good comment about SoFi though saying that the market is very saturated and has a lot of startup companies and I appreciate that. Always something that you need to factor in the competitive environment but I think the product offering that SoFi has far exceeds a lot of its peers, at least from what I've been able to see at the moment, meaning it has a clear competitive advantage, at least in my opinion. 
Now, one special mention that I wanted to get on this list was Proterra or ACTC stock. And Proterra looks like a fantastic company with real high growth potential. They operate in a fast growing sector and already look like the dominant company in the market that they serve, which is just which makes it a very compelling opportunity to me. But the reason why it didn't make the list is because I'm still researching a lot about the stock and, and the EV market in general. I haven't actually completed my valuation on it. So then I don't have an estimated target price for ACTC to tell you about. Although we did do some very brief valuation work in the video that we had on Proterra. So if you want to look at that, you can check that out. But I am looking to do a full valuation on it very soon, only be a short one, five, 10 minute video, and I will share with you all once complete. I just wanted to mention it on the list because I probably would fit it in somewhere if I could. It looks like a very compelling company. So like I said, these were not particularly in order and were definitely not just based on my DCF fair value versus the current price. Although their current valuations did play some role in whether they were even picked or, or fifth or, or first, which is why probably Open Door and SoFi were higher than Palantir and Lemonade, which in my opinion have just as compelling growth stories behind them. And again, these picks were based on disruptors as that's going to be one of my focuses for investing this year. Not my only focus, don't get me wrong, but I just wanted to give you a glimpse into my current investing thesis and what I feel strongly about and what stocks I am watching to potentially invest more into. Maybe if we have a dip or if some of them come down slightly. Some of them I'd actually be you know, okay with investing in at their current price and I think I covered that in this video. Just for disclosure, I actually do own all of the stocks that I have mentioned on this list. Some bigger positions than others, but I do own every single stock that I've talked about on this list of five. But that just about wraps it up. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, leave a thumbs up, helps the channel out greatly. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel and put the notification bell on. You'll be notified when my next video goes up. But until next time, good luck with all your investments.